Are great CEOs born or made? Can you learn the skills to become a corporate leader, or does it take inherent talent? Have we got CEO hiring practices right, and how should we change them if we want to make the C-suite more diverse? Welcome to The Big Question, the monthly video series from Chicago Booth Review. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Stephen Kaplan is the Neubauer Family Distinguished Service Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at Chicago Booth. He's also the Faculty Director for the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Chicago Booth. His research focuses on private equity, venture capital, and corporate finance, and he serves on the boards of several companies. Mary Lou Gorno is Managing Director of Ingenuity International, the executive search consultancy where she leads the CEO and board practice for Fortune 500, mid-cap, and privately owned companies. She's also a trustee of the University of Chicago. Lyndon Taylor is the partner in charge of the Chicago office of Hydric and Struggles. He focuses on CEO and board searches in asset management, banking, and consumer financial services. He also co-leads the firm's diversity advisory services practice. And Konstantin Alexandrakis runs the U.S. arm of Russell Reynolds Associates, as well as its global leadership and succession team. He's an expert in board of director and CEO succession, search and assessment. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. And since our three headhunters are all Booth MBAs, welcome back to the University yes. of Chicago. Uh, Steve Kaplan, let me start with you, because you've actually done research on CEOs and what, makes, what, what, people are, what companies are looking for in a CEO. What did you find? So I had a very nice sample, which was probably unique, of almost 3,000 candidates for C-level jobs. And so you could see what a CEO looked like compared to others. And CEOs compared to a chief, financial, to a chief officer. financial officer, a chief operating officer, and people in the divisions. And what you find is CEOs are different. And how are they different? Well, they're, when you look at all their characteristics and experience, uh, there are four basic factors that come out of the data, and those four factors are talent, uh, execution, charisma, and creative strategic ability. And the CEOs, relative to others, are more talented, more execution-oriented, more charismatic, and more creative and strategic. Okay, and just to dig in very slightly, the there was a pretty broad term, talent. So what, what do we mean talent by Talent is really kind of everything. So somebody who, who scored high on one thing tended to score high on a lot. So talent would be being charismatic, being execution-oriented, being uh, good with people. Uh, sort of every, everything they were rated on, they would tend to score I well. See. So being a good all-rounder. Exactly. Generally skilled and... and uh, exactly. Okay. All right. Now, um, does that suggest that there's a CEO type? What that suggests is there that CEOs are different and there is a CEO type. What was nice about this data is that we took the people who were not CEO candidates, so it's kind of an out-of-sample test, and then we looked at which of them became CEOs later in their careers, mm -hmm. and it turned out it was the same variables. So the more talented, the more execution-oriented, the more charismatic, and the more creative strategic. Okay, Mary Lou Gorno, does this kind of chime with your world? You're looking for CEOs. Is this, are these the sorts of things you're looking for? Um, I'm happy to say I think they are. I think there is a, um, as you think about the characteristics of a CEO, I would capture the, the things, the factors that Steve just talked about. I might place one additional element that I think resolve, unwavering resolve, is very, very important. And I might actually place that in a separate and distinct category, even though I know it's, in, I'm sure, incorporated in that form. It's in execution. It is a big measure of, ex or a big part of execution. Okay. Lyndon Taylor, does it make sense to talk about a CEO type? Uh, to some extent, I think it does. I, I think of it broadly as leadership types, who succeeds as leaders. And uh, to some extent, a CEO, or a person who's going to be a CEO, has strong leadership, right? They, they, all the things that, that Steve talked about, those are all leadership traits in my, in my mind. And CEOs are leaders, and they not only have those leadership abilities, they have the ability to articulate a vision that people can buy in, right? So it goes partly to the charismatic uh, aspect that Steve talked about. A great leader has the ability to articulate a vision 
vision and get people to follow, right? So you see a constant thing. They have followership uh, and they attract talent. So that all of those things go together and that makes someone a great leader in my mind. Okay. And, and Constantine, what do you think about this idea of isolating characteristics and saying this is a CEO? I, I, our studies at Russell Reynolds have shown that there are, there are definitely characteristics that separate uh, CEOs from non-CEOs and great CEOs from mediocre CEOs. Uh, but to your question about are there different CEO types, we also think that there are uh, different contexts within which CEOs operate and that the best ones are able to pivot between those depending on the situation their company is facing. Um, so whether it's uh, a CEO that can move from an attack mode of trying to fend off a competitive threat to one that can move to a fortification mode of bringing various stakeholders together in order to amplify what they're trying to do with their business strategy. So does that, does that mean you would be looking for a different type of person in those two situations? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so in your, in your view, there isn't necessarily a, a, a single type. There are characteristics and experiences that characterize the most successful CEOs, but those, those will vary depending on the situation, of course. Okay. Steve Kaplan, quite a lot of attention when this research came out was focused on um, the fact that CEOs didn't necessarily have to be nice. Correct. So where does that come from? So <clears throat> the, the data, if you look at this factor, this execution factor, kind of the flip side of that is being agreeable. So being agreeable means uh, being a team player, treating people with respect, and yeah, you, know, you could say being nice. And in the data, uh, those people are less likely to become CEOs. And then in another paper that I have, those uh, characteristics are kind of irrelevant to how the company uh, and the CEO performs. What's relevant is the execution side. And the more I learn and the more I see, the more I believe that result. And, and here's why. If somebody is too nice and too agreeable, they are not going to get things done. They're going to be too consensus oriented. They are going to be slow. And it is very frustrating to the people who do want to get things so, done. Steve Kaplan, just to be clear then, does that mean that likability and execution are actually two uh, diametrically opposed skills? So likability, I think, is the, the wrong word. I think agreeableness is the right word. And if you look, again, at the data, holding talent constant, there's this trade-off between being agreeable and being execution-oriented. And I think that comes from when you execute, when you move fast, when you're aggressive, sometimes you step on toes and you appear not to be agreeable. If you are consensus oriented and a little slow, you're gonna appear agreeable. And I think there is a definite conflict between those. And the danger of being too agreeable is that you don't get things done and you frustrate the people who wanna get things done. And so, in, again, in the, the other paper, the people who executed were the people who were successful. And in talking to... Um, so just to explain, your other paper was about once the CEOs are in position, how well do they is, do? Exactly. And in talking to executives and talking to private equity investors, this, this actually resonates. And you know, if you want an example you know, that people are aware of, Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos, are two people who are not known to be the nicest uh, people, but boy, do they get things done, and people like to work for them because these companies make a lot of progress, despite the fact that it may not be, you know, quote, you know, the nicest. Right, and they have the vision thing that Lyndon referred to and the leadership skills. Yeah. Mary Lou? You know, I was thinking about this in the context of not all great leaders become great CEOs. Many do, and I think the difference is with just what Steve is talking about, is that great leaders have to contribute to results, bottom line, impact. And if you're unable to do that, you're a great leader, but you haven't made that successful transition. And to you, the you, don't have to be, you don't have to be a jerk. I mean, that's not, not, we're not, saying, yeah, we're not no. saying you have well, to be I have a jerk. Something. It's saying, it's, I think you can be agreeable and still get things done, but they are sometimes in conflict. And if you, you, know, if you have to get things done, sometimes you will, you know, not be so nice. Well, and our data supports that, Steve, about agreeableness, but it also says that the best CEOs tend to be unpretentious. 
and that that creates a difference. So something to think about. Yeah, and unpretentious mean makes them more likable? Or? Makes them able to get their teams and their stakeholders to execute more effectively. Yeah, I mean, how would you, ba my question would be, how would you balance you know, not getting bogged down in decision making with letting everyone have their say and listening to people. Right? I, I, I mean, that's part of what being a great leader is. If you look at it, um, we've looked at it, and great leaders have confidence, right? So they're willing to take in all the information, take in the data, and make a decision. And they're willing, to, as, as, as Steve said, to execute, to make a decision, to live by it. People can agree or not agree, but if you look at great leaders, great CEOs, quite frankly, as well, make decisions and lead and people follow because they've made the decisions. They are willing to execute, they take the risk. Right, and the worst thing is not to make a decision, yes. right, because then nothing, then you know nothing will happen. And if you make a decision and it's wrong, you know, if you fix it, you, know, you can still be successful, but you've made a decision. And I think going on what you were mentioning about being unpretentious, an element of that is being genuine. How do you as a headhunter measure that? It's not easy. I think part of it is just talking to in individuals about how they've achieved success, and the environment that took place around that. Very, very much so. I think what we are increasingly doing is focusing on the science right behind our art. So our art is to help select and evaluate talent. And increasingly, we're developing tools to look at how do, for, uh, how do leaders make decisions? How do they lead? For example, we have a tool called Leadership Signature, which looks at how does a leader lead? What's their style, right? And certain leaders fit certain styles, as Constantine talked about, in certain situations. So you're looking for to bring together a team, right, that has complementary leadership styles to then move the organization forward. It's a combination of data and analysis and experience. Yes. Now, now, how much <clears throat> comes from interviewing the candidate versus reference checks versus do they or taking tests? Those are three different. It's, it's all part of so it. So you do and all three. We do yes. all three. And I, and I think what, and you, what you find is you look for the outliers, right? Where, does, where is that something is incongruent to what you found in the interview, to what the psychometric test or, or, their, or their competency says, to what the reference says? And so what you generally look at for us is we put the, take the first two, and that's the context in which we take the reference. Right, to look at where there might be gaps and incongruencies, but they all come together. To what extent, Lyndon, in your mind, is this leadership you talk about inherent or learned? Um, <laughs> I, I, I will say this, I don't believe that you know, great leaders are born. Right? I think great leaders are developed. If that's the case, you know, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this room and a lot of us would not be in this room. So there is an element around uh, community context and uh, mentorship that great leaders have, right? And I think one of the things that they are, if we didn't talk about this, is they're learners, right? They're quick and adaptive learners. So the, the context of this is you put them in the right situation. They learn from it, right? They, and, and they grow from it. So I don't think they're born, to answer your question. <laughs> I might add a little more that I think that foundation is very important, and I would wait toward having that foundation. And what's the evidence for that? It's the fact that there are a number of CEOs who got their early tr career training in academy companies. Uh, so it was that sort of exposure, training, operational experience that allowed them to apply their traits and become successful. And I would say, like, on the, the data side, the fact that you know, these people are, are rated at a certain point in time, and five, ten years later, it's predictive. You know, that suggests there's, there's something that, that's innate or, or long-term. So it may be, it's not clear when they learned it, because these people were all assessed in their, you know, probably their 40s. But it's something that, that does last. So it's, it's, not a, it's not learned in the sense that, that the stuff, when you're assessed, is predictive. That said, some of these things, so execution, I'm convinced you can teach yourself to execute more. Um, in fact, that's what Sheryl Sandberg says with Lean In. I mean, Lean In is basically go execute. Um, charisma, which is being enthusiastic, being persuasive, or EQ. Um, is, is something where you, I think some people are more skilled than others innately, but you can certainly improve on that. And uh, my wife tells me I did that. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, I, I was her project. Um, and um, the, you did it well. Yeah, 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 thank you. The creative strategic, I'm not sure. You know, those, so there are some things that I'm not sure. There are some things I think you can definitely improve upon. OK. And Steve, you found a difference in your research between CEOs and who become CEOs and who become CFOs and Correct. COOs. So what are the, 
what are the differences there? So what was, what was a bit surprising was the, the CFOs were almost the opposite of the CEOs. So whereas the CEOs were charismatic, the CFOs were not. That's probably not surprising. Uh, where the CEOs were creative, strategic, the CFOs were more um, you know, managerial, bureaucratic. Um, what was surprising were the CEOs were very execution oriented. The CFOs were actually more agreeable in terms of you know, consensus and uh, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and on the talent side, the, the CEOs tended to score higher than the CFOs. And I, I tell the CFOs when I present this, it's not that you're you know, bad people, it's just that you're in, a, in this group, which is a very high-end group, uh, the CEOs look different from the CFOs. Okay, does that chime with, with your experience, Mary Lou? Hiring CFOs? And I, I think it does. Um, there is a bifurcation in terms of some of these characteristics because you have to look at the, what are the defining qualities one needs in the role to succeed. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of how you would separate those. I think the question I'd love to everybody think about is how that CFO translates to become a CEO. Which there are several right. examples right. about, right? Exactly. And, and that's where the CFOs who look more like the CEOs are more likely exactly. to become CEOs. And, and it's successful. The, it's, the, it's the execution, yeah. it's, it's the charisma, which is yes. probably harder, and, uh, and then being you know, creative and strategic. And conversely, do we know if the less charismatic, more technocratic CFOs, when, if, they are, if they make it to the CEO position, do they do well? Do not know. I mean, what I, what I can tell you in terms of the, the success, which I, I've, the data are less good on, is that the, the, the charisma is less important, the uh, agreeableness is less important. What matters is the execution and the creative strategic in terms of being successful. So you can get by without charisma as long as you get stuff done? That appears to be the case. Also, the charisma is a two-edged sword, I think. Some people who are charismatic um, you know, are the type who bring people along and are leaders, I think sometimes they're the people who get attention and are maybe a bit narcissistic and uh, may not be uh, so good as, as leaders. From my experience, sometimes uh, uh, someone who is uh, charismatic is more valued outside the firm as they are being brought into the firm. Yeah, do you guys have a view? I think it gets yes. you noticed and it gets you yeah. up, but once you're there, you know, if it's, if it's a charisma that you're getting noticed but not getting things done, it can be a negative. Well, there, I think there is something to be said for this charisma of servant leadership, right? So people and colleagues and, and tend to follow people who don't make it about themselves, right? So if you, in your example, Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs, we wouldn't say they have a different kind of charisma, but what was attractive, it didn't, when they uh, are doing things, it doesn't seem to be about them. It's about the business. Contrast that with a, this will date me, a chainsaw owl, right? type of charisma, right, which was about what I'm doing is about me versus what I'm doing is about the organization and the people. And the, the charisma issue is tricky, especially in the selection process um, when a, a CEO candidate comes from the outside and the board is looking at him or her. Um, they sometimes have difficulty filtering out the appeal of the charisma versus the actual reality of the substance of what they've accomplished. Um, so it's, it's, it's tricky. And I think agreeableness also comes in there, that if you're very agreeable, boards are going to you know, like you more. So it's, and, and they may overweight that versus the track record of what you've got done. So you, you, all your firms do use a lot of data and psychometric testing you referred to. Do you, do you find that that uh, re reproduces the same kind of CEOs, Constantine? Uh, no, because every outcome is a little different. Um, so I, I, I don't think it creates an inherent bias. Uh, but there, there is uh, an issue around diversity at the CEO level. Um, and part of it is driven by norms and, and things in our society that haven't changed. Part of it is also driven by the fact that boards of directors aren't super diverse and also the pool of candidates that we're drawing CEOs from 
isn't as diverse as it could be. Very small proportion of women, very small proportion of other minorities. So um, that all does create some sameness in the types of people we see in these roles, and we all need to work on that to improve it. But is that, I'm wondering if the reason that the pool looks like that is because we set a certain kind of test or a certain kind of set of characteristics that reproduce what we already have? I don't, I don't think so, because the, the testing science on these things is, is relatively new in the last decade. Um, so it's, it's more around who's making these decisions, who's available in the pool to, to be looked at for these roles, and a number of other factors. Okay. Mary Lou, what's, what's your view about how we would achieve more diversity, both of opinion, so we don't just get people who agree with the board, and of, you know, of uh, demographics? I think one of the things we need to look at is the culture of an organization. And if you look at the board as the leadership, if they embrace change, if they embrace diversity and encourage it and honor it and celebrate it, I think that would provide a richer pool of candidates. And I think that's very, very important, particularly for the CEO as a leader to demonstrate that in the changing marketplace, diversity is honored in the organization. And I think that would have a huge impact. Okay, Lyndon, do you agree? I, I think I agree wholeheartedly, and I think there's a little bit of some subcontext I've, we've, we've noticed in our data is that, and Constantine mentioned it, boards, uh, executives, tend to select people who not only look like them, but think and act like them, right? So you can be diverse, but act and look just like the team that you're joining, right? When there's a big part of it, because you want to join a team where you're going to feel a part of it, but the w most successful organization, if you look at it, over time change and adapt, right? Which means that they have this core that drives them, but they're also willing to uh, be open to new ideas and new perspectives. And you can, part of our assessment looks at that, is how open is an organization, right? And that is an element of diversity. So versus just being diverse, do you look, or, or, or act diverse, or say you have diversity of thought, are you open to change, to new ideas. But there's nothing in your mind in the process itself that reproduces the same kinds of outcomes? In Not the, exactly. No. Okay, in, in the testing, in the characteristics, in the... No. no. Okay. And I, I would add two things. So first of all, in the, the data that we had, the women scored basically the same as the men. So there wasn't, there wasn't a big difference in how they scored. And then the second thing I would say is the, the pool you know, is getting bigger. So when I was, at least, you know, for women where I have, you know, we have very good data, you know, when I started, I think the MBA class was probably a quarter women, and now it's over 40%. So you'll see over time, I think, a bigger pool. Now, whether, you know, it gets to 50%, uh, who knows, but I think over time, you are likely to see uh, bigger pools of uh, more diverse candidates, and also, you know, you see white men or, you know, a lower proportion of college graduates over time. Do, do you think that these, um, the kind of tests, the kind of assessments that you use to select the candidates, are they presumably getting refined over time? So will we know more and more about the kinds of characteristics we're looking for, Constantine? Absolutely. The, as the data pool grows, we are able to go back and refine the questions, refine the analysis around the data, so I, I don't think we'll be at a point where one day one can just take the test without any human intervention and know we'll that take they the are. DNA. They, yeah, that's right. Uh, perhaps I'm short-sighted in thinking that'll never happen, but uh, th it is constantly improving our ability to, to predict some of these uh, factors. What are some what of I, Sorry. I was just saying what I enjoy about it is it helps us make better decisions and inform better decisions. So as we gather our own experience and our observations, it's strongly impacted by this. They're very they're inextricably linked. And I think they make us better decision makers. Then to what extent do you draw on data from the academic world as opposed to make a, a lot of you are compiling your own data? So to what extent do you kind of look at research like Steve's? Well, I, I actually, we, if, if going back a few years ago, we actually contrast and leverage that, quite frankly, to say, is the data coming from the academic world how does it sync with one our own findings, right? And how does it sync with what we're finding uh, from from the diagnostic tools that we're leveraging, and see where there is a difference or where uh, where, where they match up or is validated from that perspective. Well, and Steve's data is not from the academic world; it's right. real business it's real data. Business so work. it's it all helps us. We'll accept it. <laughs> Usually, it's the other way around. <laughs> Remember, we're at the University of Chicago. Okay. Well, on that uh, on that note, I'm afraid our time is up. My thanks to our panel: Steve Kaplan, Mary Lou Gorno, Linda Taylor, and Constantine Alexandrakis.
For more research, analysis and commentary, visit us online at review.chicagobooth.edu and join us again next time for another Big Question. Goodbye.